All right, good evening. Thank you for waiting. Uh, and welcome to this very filled and exciting uh, lecture, the David A. Kipper Lecture on Ancient Israel. Um, this has been an exciting lecture series. Please join us next year uh, during the academic year, starting in October, for another amazing series of lectures. This one will focus on a lot of the OI work and faculty, uh, research associates, and the jobs they're currently doing here. So it'll be very interesting and fun way to explore the centennial. And if you are not a member, please do join us. Next year we have a host of centennial programming uh, that you will get first uh, announcements of, you'll get discounts on, and some very special members only events. So please do join us next year for our centennial. And now please welcome the director of the OI, uh, Christopher Woods. Thank you, Matt, and good evening. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to this, uh, this year's David A. Kipper Ancient Israel Lecture, which is now, by tradition, our final lecture of the academic year. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And I would like to begin by expressing uh, our profound gratitude on behalf of all of us at the Oriental Institute to Barbara Kipper and the Kipper family. <laughs> For really their, their wonderful support of our annual David A. Kipper Ancient Israel Lecture Series, which began in 2013. Uh, this lecture series really markedly expands the OI's educational offerings focused on ancient Israel. And at the same time, it furthers our goal of convening leading scholars in the archaeology, philology, and history of the ancient Middle East. This is our seventh Kipper Lecture. But it's important to point out that the Kipper family's support of the OI doesn't begin and end with this lecture series. Rather, they've been steadfast supporters of the OI for years. We were honored to have included the late David Kipper among our advisory council members, and we all remain deeply grateful for the leadership shown by the Kipper family in creating and developing the Kipper Family Archaeological Discovery Center in 2008, which allows visiting school children to experience the thrills of archaeological excavation in a simulated dig. It is now my uh, great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. David Elan, who is the director of the Nelson Glick School of Biblical Archaeology at the Hebrew Union College in Jerusalem. David also holds a faculty position at the Hebrew Union College and has taught at Tel Aviv University, Hebrew University, and Johns Hopkins University. David received his BA and MA degrees from the Hebrew University and his PhD from Tel Aviv University, writing his dissertation, dissertation on the Northeastern Israel in the Iron Age I, cultural, socioeconomic, and political perspectives. David has a really extensive fieldwork experience, having excavated, uh, among other sites, at Tel Arad and Megiddo and at Tel Dan, where he has been served as the director of excavation since 2005. David specializes in mortuary archaeology, religion, and ritual in the Chalcolithic period, the Middle Bronze Age, and the early Iron Age of the Southern Levant. He is co-author of Dan One, History of Excavation, the Neolithic Settlement, the Early Bronze Age Levels, and the Middle Bronze Age Tombs, published in 1996, and of 2014's The Bronze Age Cemetery at Ara, as, uh, as well as really scores of articles, including uh, quite a number uh, co-authored with our own York Rowan. Now these studies really cover an impressive range spanning in topic from mortuary customs from the Chalcolithic through the Iron Age to ritual and ideology to issues of society and climate change, material and tool culture, ceramics, chronology, and beyond. David is also editor of the Nelson Glick School of Biblical Archaeology Journal. Now in tonight's talk, How Ancient Israel Began, A New Archaeological Perspective, David will present a, a new and, and radical proposal based on his research at Tel Dan for the origins of ancient Israel. And so um, without uh, further ado, please join me in welcoming this year's David A. Kipper speaker, Dr. David Elan.
thank you very much, Dr. Wood. Uh, thank you very much, Barbara Kipper, for making this happen so you can all attend for free. And uh, I, I also want to just thank the Oriental Institute because it's a great honor to be here. This is the, one of the top three institutions for the study of ancient Near Eastern studies in the world. So it's a great honor to be here. I don't know if you know that. So um, we're going to talk about how Israel began. Origins are something that for some reason seem to occupy our, our attention quite a lot in the world. We're always looking for the beginnings of things. And I'm, most of us are sophisticated enough to know that origins are complicated things and messy, and you usually can't find one source of anything. It's usually a big mishmash. So pretty much that's the conclusion that we'll arrive at today. <laughs> so, that's it. Um, but still, still, I think I have a certain story to tell. That's what archaeologists do, if you didn't know it already. We take little bits of data, pieces of a puzzle, and then we connect dots and make a story. And then 10 years later, somebody comes along and creates a completely different story. And we all like stories, so including our politicians. So <laughs> let's just go with it. Um, as far as creating stories, of course, the subject of Israelite origins has been so uh, worked over so often. Here are just a few of the more recent examples of some of the very interesting and rich volumes that have been produced about the origins of Israel. I will, of course, found my own thesis on a lot of what these people have done and others before them. Uh, my take will be a little bit different. Um, of course, there is this elephant in the room, which is the biblical text. The biblical text, we have to understand, is, uh, has its own program. It is a theological document. It is uh, presented as revelation, but it is obviously a compendium of lots of different sources uh, which have a purpose in their compilation and in their presentation, at least in the form that we have now. Uh, the rule of the thumb is that the earlier you go in the biblical text, the, le the less of it is, more, is historical, and the later you go, the more of it is historical and can be corroborated by extra-biblical documents from Egypt, Assyria, etc. Uh, the period of time that we're going to be talking about today is somewhere in the middle, as you will see. Uh, and what I think what we'll do first then is I will sort of take the biblical text and I'll present it in outline form and then we'll sort of deconstruct it and see what works and what doesn't work. Most of it doesn't really work. Uh, when we look at the book of Joshua, when the children of Israel enter the land of Israel to conquer the land of Canaan, essentially the conquest of the land of Canaan is divided into five stages. First, they cross over from Jordan at Gilgal, the massive circumcision ceremony. They conquer Jericho, the trumpets and all of that. They go up to Ai in the central hill country and take that and destroy it. And then they move south. Uh, there's a southern campaign. Then they move north to Chatzor, uh, destroy Chatzor and take that. And then they convene at a place called Mount Ebal in the hills above Shechem. And there's a massive covenant ceremony where the laws of Yahweh are inscribed on standing stones. And that is the covenant between God and the children of Israel. And part of that is also all kinds of prophecies which, lo and behold, actually take place later on. Um, so it starts off with uh, the circumcision at, Jer at Gilgal. And then it moves to Jericho, and I'm using all these old uh, 19th century woodcut uh, uh, drawings to illustrate the scenes, uh, just for fun. Uh, and we have then, the, they go up to the hill country and take I. Uh, I is going to be problematic, as we'll see in a minute. And the whole thing ends up with this covenant renewal at Mount Ebal that is described in Joshua 8.30, 8, chapter 8, verse 30 to 35. And this is... The thing is, is this was prophesized. It's prophesized in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy comes before Joshua. So in Deuteronomy, this was prophesized, and in Joshua, it takes place, the, the covenant renewal at Mount Ebal. Now, a critical scholar 
might say, okay, uh, so was it really a prophecy or maybe what happened at Deuteronomy was written after the events themselves? And I'll leave that an open question for right now. But here's the text from Deuteronomy. You cross over the Jordan, you shut up these stones concerning that which I command you today on Mount Ebal. And you make an altar of stones and you shall offer burnt offerings and a few other things. So you might get a sense that I am being deconstructivist and critical, but as you will see, some of this stuff actually appears in the archeology. span So don't be too cynical yet. Ancient Israel um, was divided up uh, by tribal inheritances in the book of Joshua. Uh, these tribal inheritances seem to reflect a uh, geopolitical situation probably in the 8th or 7th centuries BC, probably much later when there was already a kingdom in place. Um, and all of this biblical text, for those of you who don't know this, is framed in a chronology. The biblical text contains the year dates of reigns of kings and events that occur. And if you go through and you backtrack through the text, you can get to exact dates. That is how we know when the world was created 5,800 something years ago. We have an exact date. So when people say the world was created in the year X, that's because it's in the biblical text. There is a precise chronology in the text itself. And lots of scholars have used this as uh, a keystone in order to reconstruct historical events. We know that some of this doesn't work. As I said before, the later you go, the more precise it is and it, can, and it can be confirmed. The earlier you go, not so much. But there is this chronology and that's something we have to consider. The biblical writers knew something and other things they sort of put together themselves. Archaeology is its own kind of testament. It has its own paradigm, its own research format uh, where we present research questions and we have our own ways of doing chronology with carbon-14 dating and coins and things like that. And the Hebrew Bible has its own paradigm. These sometimes go together and sometimes they don't. As an archaeologist, my job is to start with the data in the ground. I try to ignore the biblical text and reach my conclusions from the stuff that I pull out of the ground, creating frameworks of inference, and then I'll go to the biblical text and see what works, what doesn't, and what the motivations might be behind what's written when it doesn't work. But that's sort of an after, that's the, the last thing I do. The time frame that we're going to be talking about today is presented here, the very end of the Late Bronze Age into the Iron Age, the very beginnings of the Iron Age, of course, when iron first, appear, first appears as uh, an important material culture item for making tools and things. So there's our framework. The Egyptian chronology is also very important here because it has a lot to do with the story I'm telling today. Anybody recognize this place? Backyard. Your backyard. <laughs> that was quick. So here's Jericho in your backyard. Uh, by the way, the word Jericho means uh, the place of the moon, Yereach, Yericho Yereach. It means the place of the moon. It looks like a crescent moon when you look at it from the cliffs above. Uh, and here is I. Uh, these are places that we know, that we can excavate and have been excavated, and we visit them and we see things. At Jericho, excavations took place already at the beginning of the 20th century, and what was found? Well, according to the biblical chronology, around 1300, 1250 BC, there should be a massive destruction, because according to the biblical text and the biblical chronology, Joshua destroyed it. Guess what? No destruction. There is a destruction from about 1540 BC. But after that, the town was, for, most, for the most part, abandoned. There is no destruction. So already back in the 20s, Garstang said, hmm, there's a problem here. And Kathleen Kenyon went back to dig it, and she found the same problem. And this was already a bit difficult. 
Then in the 1950s, the Danish, uh, excuse me, not the Danish, the, the, but American expedition went to excavate at Ha'ai, up in the hill country, to test the story once again, the, the Joshua narrative. And the site was excavated, and lo and behold, there is no late Bronze Age destruction of a Canaanite city. There's an early Iron Age occupation, a settlement, but no previous destruction. In fact, the, er, the previous settlement of the site dates, its destruction dates to about 2500 BC, about 1200 years before when the biblical account would have it destroyed. So that's a big problem. But here's a hint to the explanation of why that is. The name of this site, Ha'ai, means the destroyed place. The biblical writer, when he was writing about this place, already saw a, destro a destroyed place and said, okay, how am this will fit my narrative very nicely. It's called the destroyed place. Okay, Joshua did it. I'm being a bit facetious here. The heartland of the Israelite settlement, according to the Hebrew Bible, is in the central hill country of Israel today, what is now called Judea and Samaria. It looks like this, rolling hills, a chaparral vegetation. It's very dense, very hard to clear. This is a frontier. In antiquity, this is not a great place to live. You come here when you're desperate and you have nowhere else to go. Here are some of the key sites that have been written about for uh, many, many years by Albright, Finkelstein, and others that have excavated here. All of these are excavated Iron Age I sites. Again, we're talking about 1200 to 1000 BC, depending on your chronology. Uh, here is the famous site of Shiloh, located in the Central Hill Country. This is where the tabernacle was fir first rested uh, in the Iron Age, and according to the Hebrew Bible, this is, was an, a main cult site. It was a cult center for the Israelites, and people from the various tribes would come and, uh, to this place. And it was excavated by the Danes in the 50s, and once again by Israel Finkelstein in the 1980s. And a settlement was found here from the early Iron Age. But guess what? There's almost nothing here from the late Bronze Age. Once again, the biblical chronology runs into difficulties. What was found was a series of houses, typical houses that are called in our jargon the four-room house or the quadripartite house. This is a typical house for the first settlements of the Iron Age in the hill country. They have basically three longitudinal rooms and then one cross chamber uh, at some point, and you can organize them in different ways. It took the old Middle Bronze Age wall in the back that dates to about 1600 BC and used it as the back wall and then the houses were built up against it. And the houses contained all kinds of rich finds, especially rows and rows of big jars that are called collagen pithoi. Here's an assemblage from one of the rooms. This jar, this pithos called the collared rim pithos, was considered since the 1920s to be the hallmark of Israelite settlement because it was found in all of these sites in the hill country. And so William Foxwell Albright and Kelso and others said, okay, this is what identifies the Israelite settlement. This fits the biblical picture perfectly. They didn't know about the dating problem back then. Now we know there's a problem. We'll get to the solution to the problem in a bit. But this is sort of a typical assemblage. At I also, we have the same kinds of columned houses, variations on a theme, uh, with pillars down the middle of them, also archetypal, and lots of collared rim jars here too. This place is located just south of Jerusalem. It's called Gilo. It's now a suburb. It now looks something like that. Uh, the site is now gone. But underneath all those buildings was a very small pastoralist settlement with fences and a small house and it had all kinds of things like this in it. Once again, the collared rim pithoi jars and cooking pots, a very prosaic, simple kind of settlement. Once again, Ami Mazar, who excavated here said, this looks like an Israelite settlement. It's in the hill country and once again, collared rim pithoi. So what happens is sort of a circular argument. As soon as, once you say that the collared rim pithoi equal Israelite settlement, when you find the pithoi, you have Israelite settlement. And here's another one from, uh, I think that's from uh, Afek. 
the collar ribbon pithoi rims. These are from Gilo again, once again, sorry. And we go to another site which is closer down the hill, the ridge toward Rosha Ein, closer to Tel Aviv, called Izbit Sarta, which is a lovely site excavated by Israel Finkelstein in the 80s, which is a big central four-room house with a beautiful pavement. It's surrounded by a ring of smaller buildings and then a whole bunch of pits between and the spaces in between. Why do you need all the pits? Generally, when you have pits like this, and now we're pretty sure they're for the storage of grain, uh, it's because things are insecure. You're afraid that somebody's going to come and take your grain, so you hide it in pits, and even if the enemy comes and takes 80% of your gra grain, you still have some of it left that they didn't find. And this is, once again, one of these archetypal aspects of the settlements, these small settlements in the hill country, together with the collar green pithoi, lots and lots of pits like this. In this case, surrounding a very large building that looks like that. Typical four-room house. Here's one way that it could be reconstructed. There's a bit of argument about this. Some people think there's a courtyard in the middle. The lowest floor was for animals, sheep and goat. Uh, it all, the sheep and goat also, goats also kept the building warm in the winter from their heat. Uh, others, uh, Professor Larry Steger, for example, who used to be here, uh, claimed that the houses were completely roofed over and that there were no open spaces that would be too muddy and too much exposure to the elements. Uh, today, his uh, approach is uh, considered preferable, but they're still both in the literature. Here's the open courtyard version. So this is another one of those aspects of so-called Israelite settlement in the hill country. This kind of house becomes totally normative for uh, domestic architecture in the later Iron Age also. When you read about houses in the biblical text, the Book of Kings, for example, or the prophets, they're talking about houses like this. The four-room or quadripartite house was the typical house. If it was in the countryside, it was big. If it was in the city, it was small. Izbit Sarta also has one of the earliest examples of uh, the alphabetic script. Uh, this dates to probably the late 11th or 10th century BC. It's what we call an ABC diary, which means it has the ABC on it. Uh, if you go uh, over here, let's say, uh, right over, let's see, where should we start? Um, we're missing the Aleph. There's the Aleph is right there. There's a Bet. Dalid, hey, hey is there, vav, etc. You have a, b, c, d, e, etc. This is one of the earliest examples. It starts from the letter here and it goes all the way to the end. This is the taf, which becomes in Latin the T. It already looks like a T. This dates to about 1000 BC. You can also go the other direction. You can start over here, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalid. You can go both ways. What is this thing doing here? Who would be using something like that? It's somebody who's learning how to write. This is a, a, a student scribe. There are a few more like this. So this is a period when there are people who know how to read and write. It's not illiterate. And they're not using the old scripts of the surrounding civilizations. They're not using Egyptian hieroglyphics, and they're not using cuneiform. This is a new kind of script. It's been around for a while, but it's not normative, and it's not official. It's what the common folk use. The population density of the heartland where that's colored in white, Shechem and Shiloh, is in the center of the country. This is the archaeology speaking here. These are where most of these settlements are. And this coincides with the biblical text to a large extent. A lot of the descriptions that we have in Joshua, Judges, and Samuel take place in that area, in the biblical text. And the hatched area to the north and the south are less densely populated, but there are settlements there as well. When we look at the oscillations of settlements that were figured by Finkelstein in the 1980s, we find that there is a fairly low settlement uh, intensity in the earlier periods. In the Middle Bronze Age, it goes way up, and then it drops way down in the Late Bronze Age. There's almost nothing. And then in the Early Iron Age, the period that we're talking about mostly, it goes way up, once again, back to the levels of the Middle Bronze Age. So there's this tremendous spurt of settlement circa 1200, 1150 BCE, 
And the th one of the things that we scholars have tried to answer is what is the explanation for this spurt of settlement that includes these material culture features that I showed you just before? Why does this happen? Well, the biblical, uh, traditional biblical uh, uh, interpretation would be, sure, the Israelites crossed the Jordan River and came into the land, and they settled. They couldn't settle other places because the Canaanites and the other peoples wouldn't let them, so they went to the old country. That was the narrative until about 30 years ago. This is Mount Ibal, above Nablus, above Shechem, where Adam Zartel excavated in the late 70s and 80s uh, what is clearly a ritual installation, despite some naysayers. Uh, it looks something like this in reconstruction. All around it, there are lots of pits containing burnt and slaughtered animal remains. All of them are kosher. Sheep, goat, uh, cows, no pork, and boar do live in the hill country here. So that, this is, it's completely, uh, fixated on the taboo, the pork taboo, it's all kosher, and these animals have been slaughtered and they're being eaten here, and there is this, what looks very much like a sort of altar or at least a focusing place where people would gather and carry out ritual meals. So there's that. Um, at this place of Mount Ibal, on the other hand, we have earlier material which is late Bronze Age, including a scarab seal from that belongs to Ramses II or Ramses III. So that would be the time frame, 1250 or 1150, between those dates, together with a typical late Bronze Age cooking pot. So this is actually a little earlier. This is not starting when it, you would expect it to start with the uh, entrance of the land according to the biblical chronology. It's a bit earlier. But there is this ritual place up there in the hill country where the biblical text suggests it sh should be. Now, the, one of the historical uh, documents that is critical for our discussion here is the Merneptah stone, which was found in uh, Karnak in Egypt uh, many, many years ago. Uh, and its translation uh, led to the identification of the earliest mention of Israel that we know of. And we're talking about 1207 BC. There's Israel right there. Uh, the Egyptians didn't really have an L, so there, it, the, the L sound becomes an R sound. And that's led to some difficulty in argument, but basically, that's the word Israel. It starts on the right, Yisrael, and when you have the two figures with the three lines underneath them, that's what's called in Egyptian uh, a determinative. That means it's a people, a group of people. So we know there's a group of people that are called Israel, and they're a group of people, and according to their place in the sequence of geographical names that are mentioned, it pretty much looks like it's situated in the central hill country of Israel. As you can see, it's, you have Ashkelon, Gezer, Yanoam, you're going from south to north if you're looking at it from an Egyptian perspective, and then Israel. Israel is laid waste, and his seed is not. The Egyptians totally decimated Israel, and there's no more Israel. Obviously, that was an overstatement. Um, so, if we are going to summarize the various interpretations of this data for the origins of Israel using the archaeology in tandem with the text, the earliest uh, interpretation was the rapid conquest model that is laid out in the biblical text. Uh, scholars like Albright, Yadin, and most recently Bentor have championed this view that the text itself shouldn't be doubted and maybe some nuances are off, but basically the narrative in the Bible is pretty much what happened. Uh, a later, somewhat later interpretation suggested looking more at Bedouins surrounding us and looking at earlier narratives from the Genesis and things like that, that the Israelite conquest of the hill country was actually a gradual affair. There was an infiltration of Bedouin type elements from the east and, and the south that settled in the hill country and this was the a German viewpoint that was adopted also by the Israeli scholar Aharoni. And there was a lot of argument between these two schools. Later on, starting in the 50s, but especially in the 60s and 70s, with the popularity of Marxist interpretations, um, Mendenhall and then Gottwald said, actually what is between the lines in the biblical text and what we're seeing in the archaeology, because it's, a lot of the finds are similar to the Canaanite culture in the lowlands, 
is that this was actually a peasant revolt. And people migrated into the hill country to get away from the oppressive rulers of the lowlands. And the Bible does have memories of this, but they sort of put a spin on it for political reasons. The fourth uh, theory that has become much more popular of late is that this wave of new settlements in the hill country <clears throat> actually re represents nomads who always had lived there, but when they were nomads, they didn't leave enough material culture to be able to identify them archaeologically. And once it was critical for them to establish sedentary settlements uh, because of the collapse of empires all around, then they started building buildings, adopting an old kind of pot, the collard rim jar that they copied from Middle Bronze Age ruins, and they started making pits and terraces, and these are sedentarizing nomads. And that's why we suddenly see them, because they had to settle down. And this is still, uh, I think now, the most current explanation that a lot of people go by. Um, one other variant of the, the previous two is the ruralizing peasants theory uh, that Larry Steger most recently championed, and it makes a lot of sense also, and that is that uh, people who no longer had access to land started uh, going into the hills, perhaps uh, being encouraged to do so, and started making terraces and pits, and, and, and this was not about rebellion so much as just the need to expand the agricultural potential that was limited in the lowlands. So these are pretty much the five existing theses at, at this point in time. And if you read through the books that I uh, showed you before, this is pretty much the narrative you'll get. Uh, right now, the last two are the most popular interpretations of the archaeological data to explain this rapid uh, establishment of settlements in the hill country. Now we get to the Egyptians. What about the Egyptians? So let's do just a brief review of how Egyptian rule uh, uh, administered itself in its conquered territories, in its province. It wasn't actually a colony, it was a province in Canaan. Uh, this is our uh, big picture of the empires of, uh, of, the, of the region at the time. Initially, the Egyptians, after having ejected Asiatics who actually controlled the northern part of Egypt in the late 16th century BC, they themselves began a program of razzias, raids, conquest, plunder into Canaan, into the southern Levant. Um, they had a minimal presence at certain places, probably in places like Gaza, Jaffa, Megiddo perhaps, but not much beyond that, and the idea was just to plunder. Take a bunch of cattle, take slaves, take some firewood, and then go back home. And make sure that the people that are there know that if they don't send olive oil and wine, which were the big products and the necessary necessities that Egypt required, they were gonna send another plunder expedition. That was the motif. It, it worked sort of, not great. Phase two of Egyptian rule, uh, rule in the 14th century BC was a period of introversion, the Elamarna period. I'm sure you've heard lectures about this here at the Oriental Institute. A period when, the king, when King Ak Akhenaten adopted a new religion in a political attempt to shift the power from the Amun pri uh, priests and their holdings and to re-centralize authority and control with the king. This, and he built a new capital, a place called Elamarna, and there's a whole correspondence associated with that, including letters from Canaan. From those letters that you see in the lower right-hand picture, we know that things were falling apart, that Egypt did not have good control, and the petty princes, the vassal kings, war were warring against each other, and it was, it was a catastrophe. Akhenaten, Tutankhamun were... Uh, there, the, that dynasty ended. That was the end of the 18th dynasty. Horemheb stages a coup d'etat, and a new phase is embarked upon, what I would say call phase three of Egyptian rule, when Egyptian power is reasserted in the 19th dynasty. And here we're talking about the 13th, uh, 12th centuries BC. Uh, at this time, there are two big empires which are the superpowers of the time 
who are, for the most part, at a standoff, but they're constantly jockeying for power, and the zone between them is the place of conflict. Uh, various vassal kingdoms and petty princes are shifting alliances. The Egyptians are very worried about this, and that is when Ramses the sec first Seti the first, and then Ramses the second embark on a rearmament program. A new capital is built in the delta at Pi Ramesi in the delta area, as you see down on the bottom, as a staging point to reassert control over the north. And it is essential to bring the southern Levant, Canaan, under control as well, and not have all these brigands and petty kings fighting with each other because they have to make sure that the Egyptian crown can maintain its authority in its holdings. And the Hittites are a big problem. Of course, this all ends up with a great battle that takes place at a place called Kadesh on the Orontes River in Syria. And according to the inscriptions in Egypt, there are several of them. This one is from the Ramesseum. Guess who won? <laughs> the Egyptians won, of course. But there's also a Hittite version to the treaty that resulted from this war. And according to the Hittite version, they won. But the, the additional text tells us that there are agreements uh, the spheres of influence are delineated, and wi wi wives are exchanged, the daughters of the kings are exchanged, and marriage ensues, and trade relations ens ensue. And all of this rancor and all of this danger uh, with this treaty recedes. And everybody knows what their, where their place is, and uh, things are much better for a while. And this leads the Egyptians then to make sure that their control over the province of Canaan, Rechenu, as it was called at least partly, is uh, secure. And what do they do? They start establishing footholds, administrative centers, at lots of different, pla lots of different places throughout the land of Canaan. One of the most important and best excavated is at Tel Beit Shan, uh, the University of Pennsylvania, and then Hebrew University the tell we're talking about, not the classic city below, where we have, for example, uh, the administrative buildings that are very Egyptian in character, especially the one on the upper left. That is a typical 13th, 12th century Egyptian administrative building. It actually looks like a big Egyptian house with a central courtyard, two columns, and lots of rooms around it. At Beit Shan, we also have uh, inscriptions of all of the kings from Seti I onwards. So here we have Seti I, we have a stone, uh, an inscription from Ramses III, and they're all there until a certain point in time. So it's very clear, here's that house once again, it's been reconstructed. If you go to Beit Shan, don't go in the summer, but if you go in the winter, it's a very interesting visit with a great view all around. So here is the Egyptian governor's residence, and it's a typical e governor's residence. And Beit Shan also has an extensive Egyptian material culture. For example, Egyptian razor blades. They're not razors for shaving, they're razors for cutting hair, I'm pretty sure. Uh, Egyptian pottery. The key here is that this pottery is not imported. It's manufactured on site. In other words, Egyptian potters, people who have the motor skills and the knowledge of Egyptian forms and forming, are resident at Beit Shan. So there are Egyptians at this place of all different kinds, people providing services and especially soldiers and administrators. At Tel Dan, where I work, we have tens of cooking pots which are Egyptian. They're totally foreign to the local repertoire and suddenly in the, at the very end of the Late Bronze Age, circa 1200 BC, we have lots of these cooking pots, more than, any, than all the other sites in Israel put together. Cooking pots of all things, go figure. There's a story here, I don't want to get into it right now, but it's interesting in and of itself. Governor's residencies like the one at Beit Shan are found on the, in the Gaza Strip at Deir el Balach. And here's a model of one at Tel Afek, which is at the source of the Yarkon River, not far from Tel Aviv. Here's a model that the Israel Museum commissioned a few years ago. There's also a lot of Egyptian elements in the cult uh, here's an, an Egyptian-style temple at Tel Lachish uh, in the Shvela. You can see Egyptian-style column bases in the back. And that staircase, there's a temple 
that is identical to this at uh, Dir al-Medina, the workers' village in Thebes, in Egypt. Identical. And Egyptian religious motifs like the Hathor, fertility goddess motif with the lotus flowers, uh, are also present in the iconography of Canaanite cult. Even if we go way far south, just north of Eilat, to the copper mines at Timna, we have a number of cartouches of, uh, of the, the symbols of Egyptian kings engraved in the stone at Timna. Here's one from, of Ramses III. Uh, at, uh, we go up to Ramses V here, I believe, or the fourth, and then there are no more. At Beit Shan and at Deir al-Balakh, we also have cemeteries with Egyptian-style coffins. These are typical of the period in Egypt, especially in the Delta area. But this particular coffin is a bit strange because of the headdress. That you would not find in a typical Egyptian coffin. That's something weird. And what most of us think is that it is, in fact, that's a tip, those are the typical Egyptian coffins that you would find in Deir al-Balakh or in the Delta. But this one looks like that kind of guy. Anybody recognize him? He's probably a Philistine. That's a Philistine headdress. We know them from wall reliefs in Egypt where they're called Pereshtu, Philistines. So here we have an Egyptian coffin with a guy, with, that, with a, a, an interred individual that maybe has a Philistine ethnic identification. There's a, some kind of hybridization going on here. This is something that Louise Hitchcock and Aaron Mayer have written about extensively, and we see this in, 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 in this coffin, and there's lots of other examples of similar things. So Beit Shan has this in there too, and this is already getting to what I want to get at, that it's not just Egyptians, there's a bunch of hybridization going on here of different kinds. I'll get to that more in a bit. Let's move north to Tel Dan, again, where I excavate. There's a little bird that belongs to a bull that looks like this. Here's a complete one from Tel Kassila. Tel Kassila is a site on the Yarkon River right next to the Mediterranean. It was a Philistine port. It has lots and lots of painted bichrome Philistine pottery, and it has a Philistine temple in it, and it has a bowl just like this, and lo and behold, at Tel Dan, one of these bowls exists as well. Are there Philistines at Tel Dan? At Tel Dan, we also have a seal that's a Cypriot seal. You will never find this kind of seal in Israel, uh, at least not in the hill country. You might find it on the coast in one or two cases at Ashdod in a Philistine site. But at Dan, we have a Cypriot-style uh, seal. I think this is probably a seal that replicates a loom weight, a Cypriot loom weight, and it was used to seal packages of, te of textiles. But that's another uh, thing I don't want to get into right now. These kind of pithoi, we talked about the collard rim pithoi. We have lots of them at Tel Dan, but we have these also in their hundreds, tens of complete vessels like this. Uh, my predecessor, Avram Biran, called it the Galilean pithos. But you know what? That pithos form with the broad mouth and the handles on the shoulders is exactly the same kind of pithos we find in huge numbers in Cyprus and at Ugarit on the Syrian coast and in Tyre. This is a maritime pithos of a Cypriot type, and it's being manufactured by potters living at Tel Dan in this period, just when we have the birds and we have all the other stuff. Here we have a little figurine head from Tel Dan. This is probably part of what's called an Ashdoda figurine, a Philistine female figurine. You can tell she's female, I hope. Uh, some people think this is uh, a birthing goddess, uh, for, uh, a goddess that is supposed to help women give birth, uh, and that's probably a birthing stool, which is much better than what we do in hospitals today. We also have a Mycenaean-style mourning figurine. I wish it was complete, but it's, there's no doubt. There are all kinds of ritual elements here that go to Greece, that go to Cyprus, that go to the, to the, to the Eastern Mediterranean maritime zone at Tel Dan, which is an inland site. We also have this little sanctuary with uh, a little holy of corner, holy of holies, with 
a model silo sanctuary and a few other ritual items in it. And this looks very much like a whole bunch of temples that we find on the coast at Tel Kassila, but also at Cyprus, at Enkomi, Kition, uh, Phylokopi in the, the Greek Peloponnese Islands, the Cycladic Islands, excuse me. This is, in my estimation, this is a Sea People Sanctuary. Maybe not Philistine, but it's something that brings a, that comes to us from the, from the West, from the, the maritime uh, zone of the Eastern Mediterranean. So why are there so many elements of Sea People material culture in Egyptian control centers, like Tel Dan, like Beit Sha'an? There's also a bunch at Megiddo. Why are there so many of them here? And might these be connected to the four-room house in some way, the collared rim pithoi in the central hill country, uh, and these sites that are located in the central hill country. Now let's remember that the Merneptach stone mentions Israel as a belligerent force. They're not friendlies. And Merneptach left this victory inscription as a result of a, a punitive expedition to reassert authority uh, circa 1207 BC. So the Israelites that are mentioned here for the first time are not friendly to the Egyptians. They are dangerous. And that's part of the key here. And let us then also remember that the markers of Israelite settlement, those houses and the collard rim pithoi on the right, happen at exactly the time when the Egyptians have reasserted their control after the battle at Kadesh, when there are still Egyptians in the land of Israel, in Canaan. This is when the Israelites are mentioned. The Egyptians are still there. Now, here, this is a place to point something out. Think about the biblical text and the story of the conquest of Israel. Think of Joshua. Think of Judges. Where's Egypt? Nothing, nada, it's missing. You would think that if it was a story that was contemporaneous with political and geopolitics, you would, Egypt would be there, but they're not. Nadav Neiman, a famous Israeli historian, suggests that the biblical text, the writers, were writing this down 500 years later. They just forgot that the Egyptians were still there. And what was important was the Exodus narrative and the conquest of the land. They just didn't bother with the Egyptians already being there. I don't know. I'm not convinced. So there is this contemporaneity, contemporaneity that we have to deal with in our interpretation. Collard and pithoi occur in great numbers, not so much, not, not just in the hill country, where there are these small fragmented settlements and you have fragments of collard rim pithoi. They're found in great numbers in places like Tel Dan, which was an Egyptian control center. They're found in their hundreds at Tel Megiddo, excavated by the University of Chicago. You also find quite a few at Beit Shan and at Afek and Lachish. Some of them have gone unidentified, by the way. The excavators weren't expecting to find collard rim pithoi, so when they found pithoi, they were just pithoi. They were not collard rim pithoi, because that didn't fit the narrative. I got news for you, archaeologists tend to find what they're looking for. <laughs> so, collard rim pithoi are found in their hundreds at Tel Dan. And I'm claiming that this vessel form was actually introduced not by the Israelites copying an old Middle Bronze Age form. I'm suggesting that they were introduced by the Egyptians. One of the keys to this interpretation is that their volume is highly consistent. It doesn't vary in the earlier contexts by more than 7%. So this is a standardized form that's being manufactured to a standardized volume in order to provide, a, 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 to allow for the provision of someone with standard quantities. And that's why these vessels are uh, located so much in Egyptian centers, uh, like Tel Dan. Later on, in later levels, the consistency of the standardization changes. It become, the variability becomes 15%. Something happened. 
This needs to be checked a little bit more. We need more statistics. But something happened to make the standardization dissipate. I'll get to that in a second. So if these are Egyptian, why are they in such quantities in the Central Hill Highlands? So um, about an hour ago, we were having dinner in the Quadrangle Club, and David Petraeus was giving a lecture there. And he probably was talking about his Petraeus doctrine. So I'm going to talk about that right now, too. The Egyptians, in order to establish control in this last phase, phase of Egyptian rule, decided that they needed to inundate the countryside with control centers. They set up all these Egyptian uh, residencies in all these places that we talked about before, and I just gave you a few of them. There, there are something like 27 of them throughout the country. But part of this surge, this inundation, was to settle the highlands and pacify the locals, the rebellious elements. Who served the Egyptian army? Egyptians liked living in Egypt. They didn't want to go to the provinces. It was an adventure, but you know, you're, you're leaving the flesh pots. The Egyptians had trouble drafting enough people to serve in their administrative centers. And they learned from hard experience that you could not trust the locals. They tried that. 14th century did not work out well. What do you do? What did the Romans do? You go to whoever is willing to serve, and you offer payment and a prize at the end. If you are a Cypriot, or a Hittite, or a Libyan, or a Syrian, and your farm has been doing pretty well. Uh, you're not going to inherit that land if you're the third or fourth son. You're, the oldest son's going to get it. And what also happens now is a critical uh, event. Starting around 1300 or so BC, we have a very clear episode of climatic desiccation. There is climate change. It's real. We see it in archaeology. We see it when we drill cores into swamps and lake beds. We see that agriculture is drying up. There's less pasture. And we see that there is a crisis. Remember, this is a time when the empires are collapsing. Egypt is contracting. The Mycenaeans collapse. The Hittites fall. All in the 13th century. There's, a, and th there's definitely a climate element going on here. Now we know it for sure because we've tested in lots of different places and the patterns are recurring throughout the Eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East. So the farms are failing and young men have nothing to do and they're starving. One of the things you can do if you're an able-bodied young man is to go to Egypt and serve the Egyptian crown and they will send you to Canaan because nobody else wants to go there. You go serve in an administrative center in Canaan, be you a Cypriot or a Hittite or a Syrian, and you're serving there and you're a soldier and you're a man. What do men need? Wives. Wives. And where are you going to get a wife? From the locals. Now the local people, for them it's not such a bad idea because if you have a local soldier in your family, you have what we call in Israel potexia. You can solve problems. If you have an argument with your neighbor, guess who's going to win that argument? So, and it's, you know, this is a patriarchal society in the 12th century BC, 13th century BC. So women are an economic and political tool. So a woman, a Canaanite woman, a local Danite woman, let's say, marries a Cypriot serving the crown at Tel Dan, and they have children. Now this guy is called, uh, he's called Jacob the Cypriot. He's just the Cypriot. And his wife is a Danite. What are their sons and daughters called? What is their attribution? What is their group identification? They might be Cypriot. They might be just a Danite. They could be all kinds of things. And this scenario replicates itself over and over again. That, by the way, is why in these control centers like Beit Shan and Tel Dan, most of the cooking pots are local cooking pots because usually in traditional societies, anthropologists 
have done research on this, about 90% of the time in traditional societies with household modes of production, women do the cooking. When it gets industrialized, then men get involved. But if you're finding mostly Canaanite-style cooking pots in these places where Egyptians control the town, probably it's local women doing the cooking. Which, by the way, is, it's very interesting that at Tel Dan there's so many Egyptian cooking pots. I don't know what to do with that. So the Egyptians, uh, the, the, all these different people are serving the Egyptian crown. They're soldiers. And at the end of their tour of duty, say 20 years, they get a reward. And what is the reward? Think the Roman legions. You get land. And where do you get the land? Not where you want it. You get the land where they tell you you get it. <laughs> and the, the government will give you land where it needs you to be. They send you to the, uh, to the frontier. They send you to the place where you're needed as eyes and ears for the administration. And as an added bonus, you will also be able to develop the agricultural potential of the countryside and eventually provide more food and more trade items for the centers down below and actually even for export to Egypt. Always keep in mind that the products of the grape and the olive were critical to Egypt. They could not raise good uh, grapevines and olive trees. They could raise them, they figured it out at some point, but it wasn't good. It was like, you know, you know, when you buy bad wine and you say, why did I buy this? So why did I buy that Egyptian wine? I could have bought it from Canaan. This was critical to the Egyptians to be able to have access to these agrarian products. And if you could expand into the hill country and expand your ability to, raise, to uh, provide this, it's a double, it's a, it's, a, it's a win win situation. And for the veterans and their families as well. So what I'm suggesting is that the Egyptians carried out an additional surge by giving land grants to veterans who settled the hill country. The collared rim pithoi jars were established as a standard measure in order to provide these homesteading families with startup materials, uh, especially wine and oil and perhaps start up grain at the beginning. Eventually, the hope was that they would be able to produce the kinds of things that would make it an economically worthwhile. At the beginning, the hill country did not produce olive oil and wine, not yet. That happened probably at the end of the 11th century, 10th century, once the terraces started getting built and once things calmed down and once agreements were made. But in this phase, when the uh, Egyptian agents are settling the hill country, they are mostly focusing on uh, uh, farming, uh, grain farming in the valley bottoms, raising uh, pastoralism, sheep and goat, textiles, things like that. Later on, they move over to the other agrarian products. So this is my explanation for the settlement of the hill country, which is distinctly not biblical. The Egyptian rule over Canaan ends probably in the time of Ramses VI. His inscription, his cartouche, is the very last one we have of uh, the Egyptian New Kingdom. After that, there's a big gap until we have others in monumental form. And it would appear that the Egyptians basically left or abandoned their control circa 1140 or so BC. My guess is that those who wanted to leave left. Uh, and the question is, once they left, who's left? So if you are, let's say, uh, a Hittite, and you've married a local woman, and you've had children, and they've had children, and they maybe call themselves Hittites, or maybe just Beit Shanites, or something like that, you're not going to go anywhere. You're going to stay. If you're an Egyptian, you were an Egyptian soldier and you married a local woman, you might think about going back to Egypt, but if you're a third or fourth generation Egyptian, you might not even think of Thebes or Saqqara or anything else or P. Ramses as your home. You're already home. Where are you going to go? And in any case, everything's in chaos at this point. 12th century BC is chaos. 
uh, we have the massive droughts, piracy, uh, the empires have collapsed, everybody's looking out for their own interests. You have nowhere to go, you're gonna stay there. The Egyptians, the Egyptian cooking pots appear in stratum seven in the late Bronze Age, but they continue all the way down to stratum 4b, circa 950 BC. There were Egyptians there and they maintained their culinary practices for 200 years. They maintain, maintained a sort of Egyptian identity. These people stayed just as a sort of sidebar, the Levites in the biblical text, the priestly class. The Levites are quite curious, and the Bible gives us all kinds of hints as to who they are. Moses and Aaron are Levites. The name Moses, the, the Bible gives us an explanation for the name, Limsho to pull out of the water. You know the story about how Pharaoh's daughter pulls her out of the, him out of the Nile when he's a baby? But that's what we call an etiological explanation. It's a way of explaining uh, what in Hebrew it's called Midrash Shem. But the word mes means son of. Totmes, Rames. Usually there's a theophoric element in the name, the name of a god. The writers of this text actually didn't know his name. There may have been a person of that of, of, of Moses's, there maybe really was a Moses of one kind or another, but all they knew to call him was Mess, Moses. The Le Levitic priests, Hophni and Pinchas, those are Egyptian names, and so are others are probably also, Kohat, Mirari. All these Levitic names seem to be Egyptian. And the big one is Miriam. What does Miriam mean? Mary, it's a, it's a distortion of Mary Amun, beloved of the god Amun. She's also a Levite. So the Levites have a definite, strong Levitic Egyptian connection. Uh, exactly how that works, lots of people are now writing about it. It's a hot topic right now, so I won't go into it anymore. But this, there's an Israelite tribe of priests that probably came from Egypt. So who were the Israelites? Some of them were really Israelites. <laughs> They're mentioned in the Merneptah Stela. There's a group of people living in the whole country called Israelites. They're there. But there are other peoples too. For example, the Danites are probably uh, the Danuna, which are mentioned in the mortuary inscription, the mortuary temple of Ramses III as one of the sea peoples. Uh, they're also called Denyan. They may have come from Adana in southern Turkey. Um, there's a Greek tribe called Danae. Perseus is a Danae. Remember Perseus and Andromeda? Where is the rock of Andromeda in the story? Next to Jaffa, near Tel Aviv. Who's the most famous Danite? Samson. Samson. Think of Samson. What are his features? He's really strong. He has long hair. He cavorts with women and Philistines. What kind of Israelite judge is that? <laughs> Samson is Hercules. He's a Greek hero. The Danites are Danae. They're a Greek tribe that migrated from the coast of Turkey or Cyprus, maybe. And it goes on. We have Egyptians, the Levites, <laughs> and probably all kinds of other ethnic groups that assimilated or acculturated. Think about the biblical texts. Who is the general that David sends into battle to get killed when he falls in love with Bathsheba? Uriah the Hittite, right? And in Genesis, there are Hittites. There's a guy named Ephron, who Abraham buys the Machpelah cave in order to bury his family. He's a Hittite. That's really important in that story because he's a foreigner. And the account of Abraham buying the tomb plot from Uriah the Hittite, from Ephron the Hittite, is the text telling us, yeah, we were foreigners, we came here later, there were other people here before us, but look, there's that Hittite guy who was here, he already had fields and he had a tomb, and we bought it with money for a contract. It's legit, it's legal. He's a Hittite. Where did Hittites come from? In the 13th century, 12th century, Hittites served the Egyptian crown, they served in the army, and they stayed there, and 
they kept their ethnic identity for a long time afterwards. He's that Hittite guy, and they were good in military affairs, and that's why Uriah was a general. And we could go on and on with that, but I won't. The Israelite settlement was initiated by the Egyptians. Once the Egyptians left, things got complicated, as they tend to do. Security was a real issue. It was a struggle to subsist. Remember, the drought, the extended drought, affected Israel as well. The hill country is maybe a little better off because there's a little more rainfall. Um, this also is immigration and refugees are a big part of this as well. The people that served the Egyptian crown that had stayed after the Egyptian administration left, they may have even written to their relatives in Cyprus saying, you should come here. We're at Tel Dan. We have this terrific source of water, the source of the Jordan River, great fields all around us. We're a bunch of warriors here. Join us. We need more people. Come. And part of the immigration to the land of Israel, including in the Philistine coastal plain further south, may well be associated with refugees that came to join their brethren when they knew there was a place to go. This is how refugees work. You don't just come when you don't know anything. You have a relative. Think of all the Hispanic people you know who have made it good here and done good things. They came because there was a pioneer, somebody who came 50 years ago, set up shop, and then the family started coming. That's the way migrants succeed in a new country, and it probably is the same uh, in ancient Israel. Once things start coalescing, people are at each other's throats, but eventually they learn to make alliances. And part of all of this is also probably a religious transformation because you have this big salad of all different kinds of religious beliefs and cultic behaviors, and they're going to influence each other, and something is going to come out on top, or at least there's going to be some coagulation of different kinds of things into something that's a little more mainstream. And I would suggest that the description in the biblical texts of ancient Israelite religion uh, uh, crystallizing at this time actually finds its echo in uh, the archaeology as well. And that could be a whole other lecture. I won't do it now, but it, there's data to support that as well. And I would also suggest that the book of Judges is a pretty accurate representation of what the land of Israel looked like circa 1100 BC. The conflict, the charismatic leaders that come up and then fail or succeed, and that eventually um, you need to, uh, the nation coalesces uh, in tribes initially, shifting alliances as we said, borders become established uh, that are more uh, clearly recognized, and kingship is established, first with Saul, then with David. Of course, Samuel was made sure to tell everybody, are you sure you want a king? It's not always a good idea. There is a downside, but they decided they wanted, and that was probably because they, it, it was something that was needed at the time, because there was a big enemy, especially in the south, the Philistines, but again, that's another subject. Thanks very much. And we do have time for a few questions. We do. OK, so questions. OK. OK. Aside from grain, grinding grain and cooking, uh, women would presumably, because they'd be with the kids most of the time uh, and suckling them, uh, be the primary transmitters of culture. How would that fit into your story? Um, sure, but I would suggest that that is one of those sort of cult those kind of things that we say, and it's not 100% true. I think that men do transfer culture also, especially if you're a macho guy and you're a warrior. I mean, your kids are going to say, my dad, you know. <laughs> you know. And the dads, you know, they don't talk very much. They just go out and do stuff, and, and the kids admire them, and the mother says, why? Why, you know, he's not transmitting culture. <laughs> uh, 
I'm actually being sort of serious in my reply. I don't, I don't think it's so, I think it's more balanced than that. Yeah, but they were, they were getting things from both sides, for sure. And probably they were speaking the mother's language. And we see that in the archeology, span you saw the ABC diary. Everybody was adopting the Canaanite language and, and the script, those who knew how to read and write. Which, yeah. I have a, just the A and B uh, portions of the question. Just in support of your, of your pointing out that those, some of the uh, Levite priests probably or possibly had some kind of Egyptian origin, there was a book called The Culture of Ancient Egypt written by a professor from here at the University of Chicago many decades ago. But in that book, which he presents two psalms from the Hebrew psalms and compares them to some songs from Egypt or some writings in Egypt, and the, the, the correspondence is just astonishing, the word by word, uh, the similarity. So, and the, uh, the B portion is, could you comment a little bit about Kirpit al Mastera, the work done on this tell in the, in the Manasa um, tribal lands by Ralph Hawkins, and how he, are you from? Can you comment on that and how what he found there in Kibbut al Mastera with they couldn't identify the above ground structures, but when they dug deep in the trenches, they can date them to to the um, Iron Age one, and he believes that um, they're not sim similar with things that they found from the Middle Bronze Age in that area. So that make, leads them to conclude that they, this could support the crossing of Joshua from the Jordan River as described in, in Joshua 3.16. Thank you. Um, as far as the, book, the Psalms go, this has been recognized already for about 50, 60 years that a lot of, but the thing is that the Psalms may have been a later addition to the canon. So that it could be, let's say, a late Iron Age or a Persian period addition uh, when people were much more exposed to international languages and literatures and it was adopted. So uh, it could be a later edition, and at the same time, it could also be early, and that's not a surprise. Um, as far as the Hawkins excavations, um, we, uh, Ralph Hawkins and I had a couple discussions. I mean, we were sort of at, coming at it from a completely different point of view. Um, it's not, when I point that out certain places where the destruction layers don't correspond with the biblical chronology, that doesn't mean to say that nothing corresponds. There are a number of places like Lachish, for example, where there is a destruction layer, where it should be in, at the end of the Late Bronze Age. Um, so you're bound to find a few of them, or many of them even, that work with the biblical text. I'm uh, looking at the ones that don't work, especially those that are particularly prominent. Um, and again, uh, when, you do the, a, a good, when you do good work archaeologically, you publish the data, and then we can all look at it and interpret it and uh, have arguments in our conferences. That's the fun. Professor, I was wondering how the material culture is created. How is the work organized to make all those uh, pots? And uh, are, are these, what kind of homes are these? Does everybody have a home like that? And, and who does the work? Who makes the swords? Who makes the armory? Stuff like that. Did, um, did you study that kind of thing? We're not 100% sure. It's a good question, actually. Um, we're, it seems that most of the work is done by the extended family. Uh, you know, like the Amish build a house and they have a barn raising ceremony. It's possible that some of that took place. Um, it seems unlikely that everybody knew how to build a building, a really good building. So probably uh, there's somebody around there who specializes in building and knows how to at least give advice. Uh, it's, you probably don't hire outside workers to do the building for you because that is just too expensive. Um, and some places don't have four-room houses also. Um, as far as pottery goes, when you're looking at smaller vessels, bowls, cooking pots, um, in traditional societies, uh, usually it's women who do the, uh, make the pots. And this is something that's passed on from mother to daughter. And somebody before said that uh, the woman is usually in the house with the children which means that certain activities are more confined to women in traditional societies, and that is cooking, grinding of flour, um, and taking care of children They're in the household while you're doing these things, and making pottery from time to time. Um, when you get to the more sophisticated, very large vessels, then it's specialized. 
and making collard and pithoi requires a lot of knowledge and experience. As far as we know from petrographic examination of the pottery through the microscope, there looks, it looks like there are altogether about five centers of production in, in ancient Israel. And that probably means that there are specialists who may be men or maybe not just men who are making the pottery for the Egyptian crown and the pots are being sent to various places wherever they are needed. And we have time for one final question. Don't have to. Um, I just, uh, I'm just curious, has there been any genealogical studies of uh, either uh, burials in that area from that time or current populations that can trace back their genealogy to Cyprus or other parts of the Middle East to confirm some of the conclusions so that like you've come DNA. From? Yeah. So it's just beginning. You know, in order for DNA to be viable, you have to have collagen in the bone. And if there's no collagen, uh, then you can't do anything with it. There are some examples of, of where collagen has been preserved. Here's the big problem with um, burial of people. In the early Iron Age, people stopped burying their dead. All the Philistine sites from the 12th and 11th century BC, there are no cemeteries. So, as my colleague Bill Deaver sometimes says, they died in the Iron Age and they were buried in the Iron Age 2A. But, um, <clears throat> but uh, something changed radically, so we don't have the human bones to be able to analyze them. And if we do have them, in the rare cases we do, a lot of times there's no collagen left. One day, 100 years from now, we'll be in a different place. <laughs> we are looking at animals, and there has been some really interesting work on pork, on pigs. Uh, from Philistine contexts, and the DNA from pigs in Philistia looks like it comes from Europe. And in fact, most of the pig population in Israel in the Iron Age, where you do, wherever you have pigs, looks like it has uh, markers for European pigs. Hmm. But that's about as much as we can say right now. During the period of the Egyptian administration, how did they communicate with their administrators? What language did they use? So we're not 100% sure. We're pretty sure they were using uh, hieroglyphics on papyrus scrolls. This is a research problem I, uh, program I'm going to be doing this year, trying to figure out if there was papyrus in Israel uh, that was being used. And maybe that's why we have so few documents, because papyrus doesn't preserve. So probably it's mostly by written missives, but we also know that the Egyptians have a function that's called the runner, the messenger, who are running from place to place. By now there's also horses. Maybe they're being used. We don't know. Um, and so this combination of human means of transport and written documents, probably in hieroglyphics, is what's being used. But as you saw in a couple of the slides, the alphabetic script is already coming into use. Uh, again, probably on papyrus, and it's being used by the common folk, and maybe soldiers are doing that. But the administrators are communicating with Egypt, probably with hieroglyphics. I have a logistical question. Um, you showed us the hill country, <clears throat> which looked like it was a mess to go through with rocks and uh, brushwork. How did they get the stuff from Egypt, like those giant pisos you could get on water, but then how did you get the materials over the hills? So for one thing, the pithoi were not being manufactured in Egypt, they were, local, they were manufactured locally. For example, in the hill country, no, there's a hill country site, a uh, place where they're making it. From the clay, we can identify it's in the hill country. There's probably another one in Jordan, in the hills of Jordan. There's another one on the coastal plain. There's, a one at tell, there's one at Tel Dan. So there are centers located as nearby as possible because those jars really are heavy. You're right. As for other things, probably the, the, the roots run at the base of the, of the watercourses, at the gulches. Not on the hills and not so much, uh, but at, and not in the middle of the streams, but at the edge. That's where the trails are today. And probably, and they're using donkeys. And we're not using horses or mules yet, it's donkeys. So donkeys can pretty easily get through a trail that goes along the bottom of a slope. 
Folks, can we thank our speaker one more time?